Kipper! Jason! <laughs> How are you? I'm good, man. What's happening? Hey, man. It, it's all about you tonight. This is your oh. moment. Oh. <laughs> this is so funny. Look at you, man. Where you get that beard from, bro? Uh, I have no idea. It just popped up on my face during quarantine. <laughs> Quarantine face. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's quarantine face. Hey, man. So this is like mad awesome. Um, let me just say, um, I'm like crazy proud of you for doing this. I know everybody's been trying to find their avenue in the uh, COVID environment, mm -hmm. and uh, and I think you really tapped into something, and I'm I'm very proud of you. That's very awesome. Thank you. Thank you. That means a lot. I appreciate it. Um, it. Honestly, it was just a random thought one day. I know that you know as a, a, a songwriter and a studio musician, you have some of the greatest conversations before the session even begins. Just, oh, sure. just about music and about life. And so I, I wanted to convey some of that, if I could, uh, sure. via the show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, so let me just take a moment to introduce you, the magnificent Kipper Jones. To I know me already. Well, but you know you, and I'm sure most people already know you, but we're going to tell the folks that don't know you so they can get a little education. So oh. so, so I'm going to name some songs and tell me if you, you wrote those songs, okay? Oh, that, that, should be, that should be easy. I want that you back easy, by right? Jackson 5. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> How about Baby by Brandy? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I wrote okay. that. Okay. Well, what about... I, uh, I, yeah, yeah. You know, um... I'm so sorry. We have a train that lives by us. <laughs> oh my! Okay. <laughs> and so sometimes it like makes the house creak. But um, you know, I, and let me say this before we really get started. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you said yeah, you wrote that. You wrote that. Um, I'm very clear about the fact that I have been gifted to get these songs in my repertoire, yes. Um, yes. and so if I can say anything that I'm just grateful to be the channel that God used to get these songs into the atmosphere. Um, so I, I don't claim any uh, ownership over the gift. I'm mm -hmm. able to be gifted. Um, so that's that's kind of how that works. So yeah, I wrote this song. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the long and short of it is, no, I love it. I love it. So, so we'll say that these songs came through you and Music was changed forever by some of these songs. Um, what about "Broken Hearted" by Brandy? Is that is that one of your your gifts to us? That that is that that <laughs> absolutely is, and that was certainly uh, I I mean that was that was so uh, very vividly given to me. Um, Keith Crouch, mm -hmm. my uh, dear friend and songwriting partner, um, gave me that track when we were engrossed in the Brandy album. We had already recorded. I want to be down. We had already recorded baby. I think we had done best friend at that point. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, which I didn't write, but of course we were all part of that human rhythm, young legends camp at that point. Um, gotcha. But um, I had that track for that ballad for weeks and couldn't come up with anything. Um, I mean, you got to mind you at the time, I'm a 32 year old grown man. And Randy was a 14 year old, very gangly teenager with this incredible, <laughs> incredible gift of voice. And um, I didn't know what to s speak from her, uh, subject matter wise. That was gonna be, uh, I mean, an, an issue. Um, it's like, okay, she's 14, so who is her audience? Well, other 14 year old girls. Um, mm -hmm. And what do they talk about, uh, boys and, and getting their heart broken, you right. So what should she be telling them? Uh, well, if you get your heart broken, you get over it. Ah, that's it. And it just started coming. I'm young, but I'm wise enough to know that you don't fall in love overnight. I was like, oh, oh yes, yes. You know, just start writing it down, <laughs> you know. And it just came like a stream of consciousness, man. And that, that was broken hearted. And I've had people tell me, how important that song was to them, uh, oh. that it saved them in broken relationships, that it saved their life, which is like, just mm. crazy to me. 
Um, but yeah, man, that's one of the songs I'm most gift, gift, grateful for being gifted is that one. Wow, that's yeah. incredible. So, so what about uh, The Right Stuff by Vanessa Williams? A, a pivotal uh, song. Pivotal, pivotal. Uh, yes, uh, more than just pivotal. I mean, that's really the the one that kind of got the ball rolling. I mean, I had been writing songs for you know people, and uh, the group that I was in was in a band called Tease uh, mm -hmm. in the early '80s, and um, had written you know a lot of the catalog for that band um, for our first two albums, and then I got a call for uh, from a friend of mine, Ed Eckstein, who was. Uh, then the president at uh, Wing Records, which is a subsidiary of uh, Mercury Records. Now, mind you, I am so blessed in my life to have friends like Ed Eckstein. Ed is the first African-American, the first black man ever to head a major record label that wasn't his own. Wow. Uh, you know, we have a Barry Gordy and, a, you know, and all those kinds of people like uh, Al Bell from Stax and that kind of thing. But Ed Eckstein was the president, first black president uh, at uh, Mercury Records. Um, uh, and what's so interesting is a label that his dad, Mr. Ed, uh, Billy Eckstein, the great balladeer and band leader, uh, actually recorded for uh, okay. uh, generations ago. And um, but anyway, so Ed called and says, hey, man, I signed this girl. She was Miss America, yada, yada. She's looking for some music. She's been working with a bunch of people, George Clinton and all that, and it ain't happening. And we need a song for her. Do you have a song for her? And I was like, oh, absolutely. Vanessa, yes, I have a song for her. Uh, <laughs> I did not. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. But I said I oh, did because here, here's my <laughs> advice to anybody listening. When they call you and ask you if you have it, Say yes. Yes. If you don't, if you don't have it, it, that's okay. Get it on the way to the meeting. Take the meeting. Don't miss your window. Don't miss your blessing. So I said yes and took my little cryptic little piece. I stayed up all night and hammered it out and took it up there to Ed. And he's like, mm, it's got good bones. Uh, maybe you can call Chucky and uh, Rex, who uh, Rex Solis was our keyboard keyboard player at the time, and Chucky Booker, my very dear friend and and brother. Uh, and they kind of helped me congeal it and make it make sense. And, uh, and then we took it back and Ed was like, that's it. That is it. And so mm -hmm. he called Vanessa and her, uh, her then husband, Ramon Hervey, who was uh, representing her at the time. And we took the meeting and she was like, oh, my God, for me? Um, I was like, yeah. <laughs> she was like, yeah. I was <laughs> like, I, it's, I, I don't, that's not my wheelhouse i mean she's broadway she's show tunes she's she got that thing down but she was like i, I don't know if you know if i can do and i'm like no 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 no. we will go in the studio i got you we will be fine trust me you'll be great um and we went in and cut it and the rest is that gold album right there on the wall um, hey, and, hey. Uh, well Sweet. actually that gold album actually ended up going platinum, so <laughs> it's okay. Um, and there but, we go. But yeah, that um, that was the thing. And if anybody has that album uh, in the liner notes, liner notes. Now there, there's a phrase you don't hear much. Um, what are those? <laughs> <laughs> so those are like the credits that people used to uh, put in what we used to call albums. What? And um, yeah, that thing. And so, <laughs> so um, in the liner note, she says, and thank you, special thanks to Kipper Jones, the lick master. And I just had this conversation with her because she was on my show a few I weeks saw ago. That. Uh -huh. <laughs> she was on my show, No Better with Kipper Jones. And I was like, so V, you got to clear something up. Um, I mean, after all, you are Vanessa Williams and you called me the lick master and the people want to know <laughs> what in the world I did to deserve that title. <laughs> so, right. Yeah, but it was just all about me just going through the 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 delivery process and getting her acclimated mm -hmm. to singing like this R and B stuff and you know right. and, and being comfortable with it, you know. So I was giving her all these little licks and you know Ooh, you go with Mr. Right. I mean, you know, she was like, hey, I did it. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. 
Yay. You, did, you did, and you smashed it. Yeah, you did. And and she was rapping. I don't know if y'all remember that. He's the only mm -hmm. one to get me that loving cuz. Next to him, there is no other one. He's very sexy and oh, so sweet. And he knocks me off my feet. Come on now. V is a hip-hop pioneer in this business. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, so how did yeah. the process change between that song and the COVID song, her second album? Well, um, the right stuff, again, I wrote for her. Um, thinking this is what she should be doing. I was a huge, still am, and always will be, a huge Jody Watley fan. Okay, and, yes. And so at that point, Jody was, you know, his father, son, Holy Ghost, and Jody Watley. And so <laughs> I um, was really trying to put her in that lane um, with, you know, the real dancey kind of R&B pop stuff. Um, but that was just me coming to her with something. Now, by the time we came to the comfort zone, uh, she had more input as to what she wanted to say, where, you know, how she was feeling um, in her life, excuse me, at that point, you know. Um, and, and so I took a meeting with her, uh, which is something that I do a lot with people that I'm writing for. Um, I want to sit down and pick your brain and, and figure out, like, how you speak uh, what things interest you. Um, I learned in one of my Berkeley classes this year, uh, my, um, I had a class called Music, Self, and Society where we talked about psychographics. You know, we know about demographics, which is, you know, your age and your sex and where you come from and those kinds of things. But psychographics, what are you interested in that the artist is interested in and those kinds of things. And I kind of implement that uh, that I was implementing that without even knowing it into my songwriting process, um, trying to figure out like, you know, what, how are you feeling in your life right now? What things interest you? What, you know, what are you uh, passionate about, uh, about speaking about? And when I had that conversation with her, we went to a, uh, Ed, Ed and I, again, Ed Eckstein, uh, met her on the set of a movie she was doing with uh, Richard Pryor and Gene Wilder at the time. And, um, I'm like, hey, V, so, you know, what's happening? How you doing? You know, she was like, man, I am just in a really comfortable place right now. Um, everything's, like, great. And Ramon, her husband, says, yeah, comfort zone. So that kind of went around the room, and it was like, you know, yeah, I don't know if it's a song title. I don't know if it's a lyric. I don't know what it is. But I was like, hmm, I got you. So uh, and you I was did with, uh, well, yeah. Well, I was working with a, a, a guy, um, another dear friend of mine, songwriting partner named Reggie Stewart um, mm -hmm. at the time. And so uh, I took it back, took the idea back to Reggie. Um, and we were into the, the soul to soul thing was big at that time. Uh, that however do you want me, you know, however do you need me. Right. And so we um, kind of took that idea, that, that loopy kind of beat and went and came up with this really cushy bath water feeling song called the comfort zone and mm -hmm. um uh, one of our engineer well our main engineer at the time jerry brown who just might be here somewhere in there um but jerry says hey man what about a flute solo and i was like hey sounds good to me uh you know somebody he was like oh yeah i'm friends with hubert laws i'm like you know hubert laws <laughs> he's like sure <laughs> The jazz, great. So he called Hubert. Hubert does this fly flute solo. We got a pop record that is three minutes. I think it's like 312 or 319. And it has a flute solo. I mean, complete with that. And it was it was just amazing. Um, you know, something for like uh, aspiring songwriters that are paying attention to this right now. Um, a good short pop song. That's somewhere around three minutes, three fifteen or so, will get a lot of airplay um, because because uh, radio loves a short pop song. But get it, get in, get your verse, your chorus, your verse, your chorus, your bridge, and you know a little something and your tag and get out of here. Um, you know all this five, six, twelve minutes. They don't have time for that. We got and if you do something that long and then they got to chop it up, it gets weird and it's not really the form that you intended it to be. 
So yeah, a good short pop song like that is just stellar. Well, what happens is is radio can play that song twice in an hour as opposed to just the one time because it's so long. Um, right. and, and man, Comfort Zone got played like crazy. Absolutely crazy. Um, it would have been a number one record, but my my dear cousin in marriage, Miss Shanice Wilson, God bless her, kept us out of number one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we were number two, and I Like Your Smile was just like number one forever. So Yeah. Oh, man, that's incredible. So, so yeah, you're dropping gems already. I see you in the comments. If you are a, a songwriter like myself, pay attention, take notes. <laughs> hey, <laughs> this is a Joe Black. <laughs> I see you. I see you. Well, yeah, but, yeah. Those those things um, those things are important. I mean, to know uh, they're little little isms that people don't really teach you, and you don't really know unless someone you know kind of lets you know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. So yeah, you don't you, know. yeah. There you have it. Um, and also, uh, I wrote another song on the Comfort Zone album called Freedom Dance, mm -hmm. which um, which actually. Um, I wrote the morning that Nelson Mandela walked out of prison. Um, wow. Wow. Uh, so the way of freedom was all about him uh, just walking out into, into freedom. And what happened was it's this dope club record. It's this really cool, really housey, clubby record um, mm -hmm. that ended up becoming a big LGBTQ anthem, um, nice. which I am mad at. I'm very proud of that. Um, yeah. And um, so Ed, in his benevolence, actually put um, Freedom Dance. Uh, okay, here's another jewel for your people. So mm -hmm. we used to have what they called singles. <laughs> and not by singles, I just mean one song that you put out. I mean singles like it was a 45, like a record with a A side and a B side. Um, now, when you sell a record, um, even the record on the B side, uh, whoever wrote it and produced it gets paid as well. Um, so Ed, like I said, in his benevolence, put my song Freedom Dance on the B side of every single on that album. On, on her Comfort Zone album. Well, that album was the album that took her over the top because yes. there, was a song, there was a song called Save the Best for Last, um, which people really know her by. Massive. Massive. Massive song. Massive song. <laughs> and I, my song, Freedom Dance, was on the B-side of Save the Best for Last. So well, why <laughs> Come on, somebody. <laughs> but um, so it, it's not necessarily the airplay, but it's the sales that count. Um, so yeah, that's so incredible. That's that's, the, my, that's my comfort zone story, and I'm sticking to it. Hey, I love it. Thank you for sticking to it. So so real quick before we get into your song list, so you yes. mentioned record sales. Yes, music's not selling like it used to anymore. No, it doesn't. So how do you how do you feel about the shift to, to the streaming model? Um, personally, let, let, let me just say this. I, um, and, and another friend of mine just, just slipped something in my inbox uh, or texted me a, a link to something that said um, streaming is not good for independent artists uh, because, you know, you don't get any money for it and you don't, you know, there are, like you said, the sales have dramatically shifted, right? Okay, got it. Um, but here's the thing. If you are an independent artist, if you are putting out a record that, um, and, and you're, 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 what do you say, facilitating a career, if you're really trying to build a career, which is more than just the record, um, but because you, you got performances to think of, uh, you have your merchandise to think of, you have all these other uh, avenues by which to uh, earn income. Uh, come on. Uh, uh, yeah. Come on. <laughs> I got something for you in a minute, though. It's going to knock your socks oh. off. But we, we'll talk okay. about that in a little bit. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. um, but if you're going to do that, then uh, you have to pay attention to the marketing funnel. 
the marketing mm -hmm. funnel being a awareness people have to know who you are mm -hmm. b acquisition you've got to get information on these people and a way to get in touch with these people who are finding out who you are right and then right. c um engagement you have to engage with these people um, mm -hmm. you know whether that's just dropping a little video clip hey how you doing whether that's getting bir a birthday list and dropping in calling people on their birthday what if luther vandross had called me on my birthday i'd have peed on myself are you kidding me i mean but <laughs> in, this, in this era we have that kind of uh, ability to make that connection now we can do that um they have uh, like you know what they call super fans um um and you can really build those relationships uh, in the new technology. So when you're talking about streaming, um, while in the, just in, in the previous era, you, somebody might buy your record, they'll just buy it and you know, that's it. That's the end of that relationship. They'll go home and play it when they play it or download it or whatever, play it whenever they want to play it, yada, yada. Right. But if they're streaming your record, they can stream your record and stream your record and stream your record at 10 times a day if they want to. And 10 times today, 10 times next week, 10 times the week after. Yeah, there's some monetary differences uh, that are quite drastic. And I think they will come to bear. I think it will come uh, into more of an actualization of what it's supposed to look like. I, I do believe that. But right now, what it does, however, you hear about artists having a billion streams. Mm -hmm. That's that may be what ten people, ten million people playing your record a hundred times, right? <laughs> right? Um, and but those people, because they're streaming your record like crazy, are going to spend seventy five dollars on a ticket to come and see you. They're going yeah. to come to the gig and spend a hundred dollars on merchandise, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to follow you wherever you go. If you set up a Patreon account, and we can talk about that, um, or something like that, they might be into you for like $50 a month or $10 a month or whatever their Patreon uh, um, pledge is um, <clears throat> and those kinds of things. So there, there is a way, there are ways to make that work for you, but you have to do the work. And I think a lot of people... Uh, especially for my demographic, I'm, I'm going to be doing a workshop uh, in, in a few weeks, but I think a lot, and it's for people from my demographic, but I think sure. a lot of people are um, so used to the old model that, mm -hmm. that quite frankly, we got lazy. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't want to do all that work. It's a lot of work. It is. Um, yeah, it's a lot. You know, because you're out there doing it, Jason. I'm so proud of you, man. You are out there <laughs> doing it. Um, but you've got to be willing to do the work in order to see the reward. You can't just... It's not like when the record company sent the limo to the crib and they pick you up and shoot you to the hotel, I mean, to the airport, and you go, and another limo picks you up and takes you to dinner with the bread. Ah, it don't, it's not that. Just get your ass in a van and drive and show up and do the gig and have your Facts. merch in the truck and Facts. pull it out and do the, you know, it, this, yeah. it, it's, that's where we are now. You know, mm -hmm. and if you sell in CDs and do, do print CDs because people do still want them. Yes. And, and, and as my uh, professor in my music marketing class at Berkeley says, don't leave any money on the table. If people want mm -hmm. CDs, have them for them. You know, mm -hmm. don't leave, you know, well, I don't want to do CDs because ain't nobody buying CDs. They just stream it. Somebody's going to want a CD. Yep. You know, have it for them. You know what I mean? But so streaming, man, real quick. Yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. You, you mentioned three steps to, to engaging an audience as an independent artist. Can you go over left, those three steps again? I left three. I, I mentioned three, and there is a fourth one. Um, but yeah. it, is, it is awareness mm -hmm. because anonymity is death to an independent mm -hmm. artist. If don't nobody know you, then, you know, poof. Um, and the second is acquisition. And we talk about, like, getting email lists. And this is permission-based information that you want to get from people uh if you have an email list for them to sign up and we'll talk more about that too a little later but uh, <laughs> you want to have people uh to give you their information so you can stay in touch with them 
uh, mm -hmm. you know, acquire their information. So awareness, acquisition, engagement. If you just mm -hmm. pop on Instagram once a week, hey, y'all, how you doing? You know, I'm just in the lab doing my thing thing. You know, oh, hey, what's up, Jennifer? How you doing? You know, text back or whatever. Engage your fan base. Engagement is nothing more prized than that engagement. Um, and then the last one that I did not mention is monetization. Mm. <clears throat> because that's how you get everything to trickle down and make financial sense. There you go. If you follow those steps, then you'll be able to realize that in a monetary way, uh, whether they be ticket sales or your merchandise or whatever it is, you'll be able to then realize it. Even, even you know, you set up your YouTube account so that you get paid from your YouTube streams, uh, you know, and all of that kind of thing. So, yeah, there's that's that's the marketing funnel um, is, is those four things for an independent artist. Um, or an independent label. Um, and if you've got a label, you know, I know you are, you're a mogul. Uh, and so you know, <laughs> you know how this goes, but, but those are the four steps that, um, that really kind of have to happen um, in order to make it, make it all work, you know. And I'm working through it now because, like I said, I'm, this is my first uh, go-round um, since I've been at Berkeley. And when I, I've mm -hmm. mentioned that, but I, I am a student at the Berkeley College of Music in Boston. Um, I'm in my second year in the music business degree program. Very nice. And that, uh, like I started out saying, you know, you were saying, how do you feel about the streaming thing? When I first got to Berkeley, um, I was one of those people who was, ah, uh, not the music business, it's dead, it's over. So let me learn something or get my degree because I dropped out of college at 19 and got a record deal. So let me go back, get my degree so I can end up teaching and go into the next part of my life, right? Well, what I learned was the record business is not dead at all. It's just different than it was before, which it always is different than it was before. Um, of course. Because it always changes. Since the early 1900s, when there was the player, player piano, and they had what you call piano rolls, if you heard a an incredible Scott Joplin song. And he was like, oh my God, I love that song. I got to go get the piano roll so we can take it home and, and dance to it in our living room. And that's how you used to consume your music. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then this thing comes along. Uh, Marconi invents this thing called the radio. And now everybody's listening to radio. Well, the piano roll people were like, oh, well, there we go. It's dead now. We won't make any more money because if they can listen to it for free on the radio, why would they want to buy a piano roll? Well, so they can have it and listen to it at home. And they still bought them. And radio and the piano roll coexisted just fine. And then comes the vinyl record. And then radio goes, oh, well, pff, there goes that. Because who wants to listen to the radio if you can go to the store and buy a vinyl record and come home and play it? Well, they, as you see, coexisted quite nicely and <laughs> had a very mm -hmm. decent relationship, you know, for generations. Um, and then came the cassette tape, and then came the CD, and then, oh, God, everything's dead. All oh, this, you know, the CD's dead. All oh, vinyl's dead. Oh, vinyl's making a very strong comeback. Um, Believe it. And, Believe yeah, it. yeah. Mm -hmm. I've, even heard, I've even heard about cassettes coming back. Um, wow. Yeah, yeah. So everything evolves. Everything changes. It's in a constant state of change. Um, yeah. and that's just the nature of the business. Um, right. Where it is right now is an interesting place for people in my age group because we can't seem to figure it out. But, but what it is is we, we can't be all bitter and mad about it. You got to figure out what these kids are doing mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, embrace it or, or not. <laughs> and, you mm -hmm. know, you know. What or be a dinosaur, get left behind. Absolutely. Absolutely. Which I refuse to do. I'm not, I'm not doing that. I ain't doing that. I'm, doing, I'm coming to the party. So, you know, I'm going to be the old Uncle Kipper at the party, but it's all good because y'all love me and I'm going to be there. <laughs> That's right. You invite the eighth party I throw in. You already know. You already yes, know. Sir. Yes, sir. Yes. yes, sir. Well, let's jump into the song list. I know you got some amazing stories about these five songs that you sent me. Um, you changed one today, but that's okay. <laughs> you weren't supposed to say that. Then I have to tell Sorry. I have to tell everybody why. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll get to it when we get to the song, but it, it's there's a very good reason. 
There's a very good reason for it. There's a fantastic reason. I'm, I'm trying yeah. to get this camera right here because I think there you I'm go. Get this camera to... right. Hold this on. angle. Hold on. Hold up. Wait a minute. <laughs> Because lighting may become an issue here because we're, uh, yeah, that's better, right? Okay, um, yeah. Yeah. You are nicely yeah, illuminated. What, <laughs> uh, what's, ha what's happening is I have my blinds open, and of course, the sun is going down here in wonderful mm -hmm. ATL. Yeah, um, it is. Yeah. You know, and let me just say, man, while I, while I have this, while I have this chance, um, I love this place. Uh, I, I absolutely love Atlanta. And everybody, if you know me, you know I was born in Flint, Michigan, but I was raised in Los Angeles. I mm -hmm. lived in Dallas for six years, six great years, um, but I'm an L.A. kid. Um, mm -hmm. But Atlanta has meant so very much to me, and I, I absolutely love this place. And I know right now, um, you know, we're in a, an interesting state, not just here in Atlanta, but in the nation and in the world. Yeah. Um, but Atlanta, there's a, the, what is it saying? Atlanta influences everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. I tell you, man, I, I just, yeah. I love this place. I love the musical community, the guys and girls in this music community yourself. Um, you know, I, uh, I've met some of the most incredible musicians and people here mm -hmm. um, that I will treasure for the rest of my life. I ain't going nowhere. If I ever leave anywhere I, I would be leaving the country i wouldn't be leaving atlanta if i stay in the states i'll be in atlanta uh, there you go I that's right i don't know where yes 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 awesome so we're going to get into the first song on your list it is classic 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 tracks of my tears by Smokey robinson and the miracles y'all so we're going to listen to just a little bit and then we're going to talk about it okay good deal Wow. Tell me about it. The Smokey Robinson, how did he influence your career as a, as a songwriter and a performer? Well, okay, so Tracks of My Tears had to be 1965. Okay. Um, so, mind you, I know why I'm, I'm old and everything, but I was three. <laughs> <laughs> I was literally three years old. Um, but... There is a certain, there's a, a, a certain sensibility, a certain craftsmanship uh, when you talk about a Smokey Robinson song. And especially um, dating <clears throat> back to even, you got a smile so bright, mm -hmm. you know you could have been a candle. I mean, just the, um, the simile in, in that song. Um, his songwriting style, very simple, but so profound. Right. Um, and the tracks of my tears, you know, people say I'm the life of the party because I tell a joke or two. While I might be laughing loud and hearty, deep inside I'm blue. So take a good look at my face. You'll see my smile looks out of place. If you look closer, it's easy to trace the tracks of my tears. Um, mm -hmm. Just the, the irony in that lyric is, is these 50 years later, it's, it's still just that profound. I mean, it, it's, it's an incredible thing. And I think the first time that I heard that song, it, you know, it's beautiful and, and it's got a little beat to it and everything, but it makes you cry. Um, yeah. and, and I didn't know why. I, I, as a kid, I just wanted to know, like, what is that feeling? How? Why do I feel like that? And I know this music is beautiful. I get that piece. But why do I feel like so sad? Uh, why do I feel sorry for this guy? I feel sorry for him, you know, <laughs> telling his story. But I understood as a kid the power of lyrics and what they can do. And that song was probably my first indication. And, yeah, I was three. Um, I'm, I'm kind of weird like that. Um, I don't know how to explain it, but I just, I just knew that there was something about this that was drawing me. That was like, you know, call, calling, calling my name as it were. Um, and, and I, I just kind of felt like it was something that I was going to do 
or that I was, you know, being led to do, even even mm -hmm. that young. And I, I know that sounds crazy to a lot of people. You don't know what you want to do at three years old. No, I didn't know what I wanted to do, like for a living or anything like that. But I knew I wanted to do that, though. I, I wanted to create sound or something that made people feel that way um, yeah. or to make people feel any sort of way that make people feel you know yeah so yeah that's 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 that thing and Smokey Robinson is the ultimate craftsman in terms of that um you know putting a, a piece of music together like that with a lyric like that my girl oh, yeah. get out of here oh yeah I got sunshine on a cloudy day when it's cold outside I got the month of May oh come on this guy's just out of here with Absolutely. that, you know. He, he walks that fine line between knowing all of the English language stuff and all of the words and still keeping it very accessible. Sure. It's supremely accessible. Sure. Um, I think the next time that I heard something that was just so pendulum swingy, ironic, like that was probably Alanis Morissette. I mean, you know, uh -huh. it, it was it yes. was forever uh, again until I heard something like that. So, yeah. So, okay, we have a good question here. Who taught you how to craft a song? Oh, um, I will, I will, I will kind of dip in there for a second because I know that there's more of this to come up. Yes. But one of one of my first um, jobs in the music business was as a demo singer for a songwriting team um, of. Uh, of two women called Marilyn McLeod and Pam Sawyer. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they were Motown staff writers. Mm -hmm. um, Marilyn's daughter and I went to high school together. And Marilyn, uh, uh, her daughter Tammy, uh, kept saying, You got to meet my mom. You know, my mom is going to love you, so and so and so. And I'm, what, 15 or 16 at the time? And I'm like, okay, whatever. And so um, I ended up uh, working for them, like I said, as a, as a demo singer. And I'll talk, delve really into that story in a bit. But um, being in that environment with Marilyn and Pam and the Motown school of how they do things, and I mean, I was in it with them at the studio um, like three to five days a week in my soft more year I was in 10th grade or 11th grade some sophomore junior year high school um, wow. and I would you know leave school my mom would take me to the studio and drop me off and I would work with Marilyn and Pam and um, and it was just incredible and I saw how they worked and they honed a song and they honed a lyric um, now I can say that better uh, no uh, no don't play that here play that here um, mm -hmm just really getting to making a song the best it could be, making a record the best it could be. Um, right. And, you know, I don't know if anybody knows anything about Mr. Gordy, but he would do, uh, they had quality control was their mantra. Um, he could have like three songs. They'd have a meeting, like they call a staff meeting, quality control meeting. They'd have like mm -hmm. three songs and he would play a song song is over and he said now you can either buy a sandwich or buy this record what is it and they'd be like sandwich <laughs> so next <laughs> you know and then he would Ouch. take that yeah yeah it was it was tough man he wasn't he wasn't going with people because he had a company to run that was going to be the biggest thing in the world and he was serious about it um and then the next thing he would also do is he would have a song like i heard it through the grapevine he's like it's a great song I'm going to give it to uh, Gladys Knight and I'm going to give it to Marvin Gaye and we'll see which one is the best. Um, and since they're both great, <laughs> you put them both out. But, you know, he was throwing it out. Yeah, and they, and they, were, and they were great in different ways because Marvin's was this very tribal sort of thing and Gladys Knight's was more, you know, boogie boogie kind of record. And so they were both very different, but it was the same song and you know, again, he was trying to get the very best performance out of this. He he knew he loved the song. It was Norman Whitfield and Barrett Strong. He knew he loved the song. He just wanted to see, you know, who did it the best. Um, right. And and that's that was his 
way about going th through things, making it the best it can be. I will write a song and tear up a lyric in a minute. I'm like, mm -mm, no, this ain't it. Because um, mm -hmm. I'm depending too heavy on me. I got to lean on the giver again. You know? yeah. So, yeah. Um, thank you for whoever uh, asked that question. <laughs> Yes, yes, absolutely. That was a great question. Y'all keep the comments and the questions coming. I'm definitely reading them as we go. So, yes, yes, yes. Around the great game, that's Stardust. That's right. <laughs> Stardust all around. All around. Yes. Absolutely. So, the next song on your list is by the great James Brown. It, it's mm. super appropriate for right now. Mm -hmm. Say it loud. I'm black and I'm brown. Mm -hmm. Let's listen to it a little bit and then we'll talk about it. Yes, sir. Classic, classic, classic. So, so tell us about how this song influenced you, Kipper. Okay, so again, I'm probably a, a little older than most of the folks in your listening audience. Um, <laughs> but um, we had just at six, I was six in 1968 when Dr. King was assassinated. Um, and up to that point, you know, we were, we were Negroes. Mm -hmm. And if, if you called me black, we were going to fight. That was not a, a good thing you were going to call somebody. Mm -hmm. um, and then along comes this song that says, uh-uh, say it loud. I'm black and I'm proud. Um, mm -hmm. No, it's, it's not only is it okay, it's an affirmation um, to accept the unique unis of who you are. And I just I mean, that's when we started wearing. Well, we I'm from LA. We didn't call them afros. We called them naturals. So we had a natural. Okay. Um, you know, and I was like, "Oh, daddy, I want to get a natural." He said, "No, absolutely not." <laughs> <laughs> I could I could grow my hair out till I was I don't know probably twelve or thirteen years old or something. But um, but it was just this awesome awareness that was enveloping everybody that I knew. I mean. I, I just, I had never seen, you know, again, this was unprecedented. And uh, up to that time, James Brown, for me, was just this ball of fire that would come out on stage and just blaze and, you know, dancing and splitting and jumping and sweating and just going off. And, you know, he was just amazing. He was so good and exciting. It was scary to me sometimes. It was just like, oh, what's he going to do? He's okay. Is he okay? He would fall down and they throw the cape on him. I'm like, oh, my God, he's losing. Um but when he came out with this song, it was different. He wasn't doing all that dancing and all of that kind of stuff. He had a message. Yeah. And this was, this was my first glimpse at uh, message writing, at, at, at a song being a message song. Um, yeah. and, and truly, it wasn't, he wasn't even singing, really. It was, it was rap, basically, um, you know, um, so... While, while it might have been an early mold for hip hop, uh, for me it was uh, very much messaging, um, mm -hmm. and this is something that um, I'm also very keen on: is messaging in songs. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to have uh, a good subject matter, but I think it's also important to be a responsible artist. Um, mm -hmm. You have to understand that you have the microphone. People yeah. are listening. You need to have something to say. Um, I'm not uh, ascribing everybody to some oath that, you know, if you make a record, then you have to be, you know, some social justice, you know, cake crusader. But, mm -hmm. but I do think that you do have a responsibility to have something to say to the people who are listening to you. Um, right. I, I just, I, I, I swear to that. Um, James Baldwin has great quotes, quotes about the artist uh, and responsibility uh, because it's just incumbent upon you. You have the microphone. Your voice is louder. You have, your, your voice is amplified. People are listening to you. Um, and James Brown understood that. He knew that he had the ear of Black America. Um, and he also understood the, par the power that that uh, entailed, that, that you know, it, it, there is, there is a, a, an economic force, there is a cultural force, there is a, 
um, a, a faith force. Um, mm -hmm. And when you start to marry all those things, we are very powerful. And he was harnessing that power. Um, yeah. and, that, and that's important. And like you said, especially right now, especially mm -hmm. right now, when I picked that song, I wasn't really paying attention to the fact of how powerful and necessary that is right now. Right now. Absolutely yeah. right now. You know what I mean? Um, I did a piece uh, on the day that uh, Donald Trump was elected. Uh, I was I was not in a good place. I was not in good space. And I wanted to artistically convey that. And uh, so I wrote this piece called Ashes to Ashes. Um, you can find it um, on YouTube. You can find it uh, on my website, kipperjones.com. More about that later. Um, okay. But uh, link, in, link in the bottom, y'all. Let's it at the bottom. <laughs> but yeah, but that's, um, again, um, the responsibility of an artist piece for me and, and mm -hmm. having something to say, <laughs> you know. So that's, that's why that song is so very important to me. Absolutely. That makes sense. So earlier you mentioned um, Freedom Dance by Vanessa Williams, which I feel like is a message song as well. How did uh, Say It Loud, I'm Black, and I'm Black and I'm Proud influence how you wrote your own message songs uh, as a songwriter and as an artist? Well, I, again, I think that seeing James Brown uh, take that step, it wasn't, um, you know, up to that point, Papa's got a brand new bag and I feel good and, you know, uh, you know, all those songs, I mean, they were dancing and they were great and all that kind of stuff and you know, but when he took that step into the social justice strata, um, mm -hmm. it just informed something in me that just said, no, it's okay to talk about social topics or personal things like that. Um, even before Freedom Dance, there's a, um, there's a song that I wrote on the tease, a second tease album called The Note. Okay. Um, and it is... Uh, and I'm not afraid to share this with you and your audience, but it is a suicide note. Um, mm -hmm. and, it, and it wasn't that I was going to kill myself. It was just that I thought about it. And if I wanted to, I would. And uh, the song says, don't dare try to stop me. It's my life. Um, I'm not an actor in a part. It's my life. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to live it up because it's my life. Um, and I, I kind of, again, the James Brown philosophy of I can say something that doesn't have to dance you or, uh, you know, get your party or your drink or your swerve on. Um, right. It could be about something for real um, uh, or something substantive or something social or something personal. Um, and and so yeah, when it came to freedom dance, um, I mean the same thing. It's a, a song of just declaring my my freedom and my affirmation in my freedom, my liberation, and it's okay. Um, yeah. I'm okay in it, and it's okay for me to be in it. And and so um, yeah, that's that's it, it. Definitely informed uh, songs that I've written like that. Um, uh, there's a bunch of them that I still have sitting around um, trying to find space or whatever to release them. Because I think the other thing about songs like that is they don't have to be uh, or represent any sort of time period. They can kind of be timeless. Um, mm -hmm. So it could be something that I wrote 8, 10, 12 years ago that could be just as applicable right now. Um, sure. You know what I mean? And sometimes those things are uh, they kind of foretell of something that is going to happen. And then those things come to pass. I did a solo record at uh, Virgin Records in 1990. I was uh, the second uh, black solo male artist signed to Virgin Records. Um, and uh, so I was a bit of an experiment. <laughs> but okay. it was fine because they kind of left me to my own devices. And my album was called Ordinary Story. And it was written in Los Angeles about two, it came out two years before the 92 riots. Okay. Um, and it talked about uh, the, the song Ordinary Story uh, says, uh, don't give a good damn about what people say to you, brother, but that's the same trick bag that got your mama in a panic. 
she used to think she was fine, couldn't be touched by anybody, but one day baby had a baby. That baby was you. Now what you gonna do? Um, and so it, it, it even foretold about uh, the riot. It just said, there's a tension here and it's blowing up. And one day the whole thing's just gonna blow up into an ordinary story, just another ordinary story. Uh, where I live, and that was what the song was called. But and then '92, it exploded. It just exploded. And so sometimes your songs can foretell of stuff because if you write from an honest place of your surroundings and your environment and that kind of thing, you can speak to the atmosphere and what's really going on, and and you'll see the two connect. Um, it can be a very reciprocal sort of sort of situation. Um, right. You know, that was, uh, some of the things that I, I say when I uh, uh, speak to large groups of young people is, uh, or want to be songwriters is be open, be honest, mm. and be humble. Just allow things to happen. Don't ever get haughty and, you know, think that it's all about you and I do. No, 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 no. But be open for whatever comes and be honest. Be true to that. Be true to that and be true to you. You know, and just allow those things to happen. And I tell you, that that keeps you, that keeps you in that cipher of, uh, of of how creativity really kind of works. You know. Yeah. 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 I don't so know. Did that, that answer your question at all, Jason? Of, of course <laughs> it did. It answered my question and so much more. So open, honest, and humble, y'all. Yes. Yes. That that that's how you stay in that space to to channel. Um, as Kipper mentioned earlier, to be the messenger and just let the music move through you. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely. So the next song on the list is by one of the great channelers, if you will, Mr. Stevie uh, Wonder. Yes. Mr. Stevie Morris himself knocks me off my feet. We'll yes. listen to just a little bit and then we'll talk about it. Oh. Yeah. Right, right. Before we get swept away. <laughs> oh. Amazing. Don't try not to cry right now. Oh. oh man. Oh man. Well, Kimber, I know we're about to hit that hour mark at which Instagram usually cuts off live videos. So so let's do this. Let's um let's go out and come back in and we'll resume this conversation, okay? Oh, uh, you got it. You got it. All right, awesome. Y'all everybody come back. We'll continue more with Kimber Jones in just a minute. All right, there we are. <laughs> We're back. <laughs> and we back. Awesome. So we just listened to a little bit of Knocks Me Off My Feet by the incredible, legendary, all the adjectives, Stevie Wonder. Um, so, so tell me about that song and why it's so influential to you. Oh, God. Somebody bubble wrap Stevie Wonder, please. I can't. Please, please. <laughs> protect Stevie Wonder at all costs, um, okay? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. He has to live forever. But then the old... African proverb says, no one ever dies as, so, as long as someone living says their name. So mm. he, will never, he, he will never live. He will never leave. Never, yes. ever leave. He'll always be here. Um, but that song, okay, so I touched on the fact that I um, worked for Marilyn McLeod and Pam Sawyer at Motown. Mm -hmm. And um, what happened was Tammy, my friend Tammy Ellison, who was Marilyn's daughter, kept saying, Ma, you got to meet this kid. Ma, you got to meet this kid. So her mother said, fine, Tammy, whatever. Have his mother bring him to the house. So my mom took me up to their place uh, up in the Hollywood Hills. And um, I walked in. I, I played saxophone at the time. Um, I you know, just started kind of singing a little bit. But I was a saxophone player. Um, and so Marilyn was sitting at her little Fender Rose, and she's smoking a cigarette. And we walk in. She didn't even look at me. She's like, mm, whatever. <laughs> and, so, and so I have my horn case and everything. She's like, uh, so you're going to play that thing or what are you, you going to do? Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So I um, you know, pull out my horn and <clears throat> so I, um, I put together and I'm there. I just said, <laughs> and then I sang, but I don't want to bore you with my troubles. But there's something about your love, you know. And so she's still sitting there smoking. She ain't look. <laughs> I'm like, I'm really bobbing. And so 
I, and I, after I got through with, um, I, I don't want to bore you with it. Oh, but I love you. And uh, so she looks at my mom. She goes, uh, what, what's he doing tomorrow night about 730? And my mother's like, um, what do you need it to do? <laughs> and so <laughs> she, write, she writes down this address and she goes, have him here tomorrow night at 730. Mm-hmm. And that next night was my first night in the business was my first night as a Motown demo singer for Marilyn McLeod and Pam Sawyer. Wow. And and so uh, just so people kind of a little background on them, Pam had written, um, I'm living in shame uh, for Diana Ross and the Supremes. I mean, just they wrote all these songs, but their big, huge record was, uh, if there's a cure for this, I don't want it. I don't want it. Right? What song is that? They wrote Love Hangover. That is Love hey. Hangover by Diana Ross. Hey. And, um, and so, um, so that song, Knocks Me Off My Feet, got me started in this business. Um, that was the, the Songs in the Key of Life album was 1976, and this had to be like 77 uh, ish. Mm-hmm. So we were still in the throes of that album. Um, so yeah, I was like 15, um, and and that's when my my career kind of started. Yeah, amazing. So so thank you to Stevie Wonder for gifting that song, gifting that incredible album, and, and giving Kipper something to play and sing on his saxophone and, <laughs> and start his and, career. <laughs> and, th- and thank you to my mother for pointing out that I needed to use that song. If it was five songs that changed your life, she's like, uh uh-uh. uh. <laughs> Because I had picked another Stevie Wonder song, because I love Stevie Wonder, and it could have been a number of songs. But she's like, well, if it changed your life, then it would have been Knocks Me Off My Feet, because that's the song that changed your life. And there you go. Like, Good job, Mama. Get them straight. Get them yeah, straight. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. It, and it did. It absolutely did. That is amazing. And the rest is history. So speaking of that history... I've seen comments since we first started. People have been wanting to know about your history with the amazing Brandy Norwood. So the next song (laughs) is I Want to Be Down. Y'all know it already, but we're going to play a little bit anyway, and then we're going to talk about it, okay? Y'all know the rest. Y'all are probably still singing it right now. I know it. I know it. Hey, who who can do the the thing? I can't do the thing. (laughs) Somebody going to have to teach me how to do the thing. Do the the thing. Do Do the the thing. thing. So tell me, Mr. Jones, when, when I mentioned your, your songwriting catalog earlier, I intentionally left this song off um, right. so that we can talk about it now. Okay. So, so, so let's so talk about it, Jason. Let's, let's <laughs> talk about it. <laughs> so um, I had just come off of uh, The Comfort Zone, uh, which is a double platinum album. It's the double platinum trophy. You better look around and point at them walls. Wait a minute. Hey, man. There it is up there. It's the double platinum one. So, <laughs> but you don't uh, see that. I love it. I love it. We love so, to see it. Um, so I was thinking that uh, because you know we were platinum with the right stuff, double mm-hmm. platinum with um, uh, the comfort zone. Uh, in the meantime, I had done the five heartbeats, where I had uh, two songs in, in the five heartbeats, um, and wow. Um, Classic film, classic soundtrack. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. What, a, what a blessing that was. Uh, and shout out to Robert Townsend for always calling me and always plugging me when, whenever there was something to do. Um, but uh, I was, uh, I'm thinking, okay, so we're going to get started on a third record for Vanessa. Um, and I was working with Keith Crouch at the time. Uh, Keith also, uh, I think I gave him like his first production on my solo record, that Ordinary Story record at Virgin. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, he was coming up as a great producer in the business. And so uh, he had this track when I showed up at his house one day and I'm like, good Lord, have you written to that yet? And he was like, no, you want to do it? I'm like, I'll be right back. So <laughs> went to the car, got my notebook and came back in. And I think me, Rasan Patterson, mm-hmm. uh, Kenneth Crouch, a um, couple of our girlfriends were over and a nice little bottle of Hennessy, and we were just mm-hmm. kind of vibing, and um, and I came up with, I want to be down, 
with what you're going through. We had that, right? And so we were just like running around the room, singing it around the microphone. I want to be down with you. Um, and we were like, oh, that's dope. So while everybody was doing that, I kind of grabbed my notebook and walked into the living room and sat down to do some verses. And it just came. Um, I would like to get to know if I could be. Um, I write rhythmically. Um, a lot of a lot of lyricists are more poetic. I think I'm not the great poet, but mm -hmm. I like to write lyrics rhythmically. So I, I like to write to the drums. Um, so I'm like right. Um, that's just my my thing. I like the drums, uh, the pocket stuff for me. I think that's growing up in bands. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm all about pocket. Um, but I came up with the verse uh, and I came in, put the verse down, and then we started listening to the song and the room went quiet. <clears throat> and everybody was like, are you listening to this right now? And it was like, uh oh, it was it was a thing. It was a real. It was a real. It was almost like when the dogs go, Haru? <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, it was. Um, it was really. It was really a thing. And so, um, Keith uh, had a manager at the time, Daryl Williams, who also worked at uh, Atlantic East West Records, um, and they had just signed Brandy. <clears throat> um, who at the time, I think she was singing background for Immature or something like that. Um, okay. But, but uh, so they had signed her as a solo artist. And when he heard uh, I Want to Be Down, he said, hey, man, let's let her demo, the, this little girl demo this record. And I was, in the words of Chance the Rapper, feeling myself. <laughs> and I was like, wait a minute, sir, sir. I am coming off of a double platinum album, sir. <laughs> I don't just let some little unknown little girl demo my songs. I'm just not doing that. Um, <laughs> and Keith, Keith was like, Kipper, just just let her demo it. It's not going to hurt anything to just let the little girl demo it. So I was like, oh, okay, whatever. <clears throat> so we did. And when I heard it, I was like, oh, shut your mouth. <laughs> shut, right. shut your whole mouth all of it <laughs> I was like yeah you're right I don't think Vanessa could have quite felt it that way it wouldn't have been the same and, and, and because Vanessa had already had Save the Best for Last with Comfort Zone her career was on another tra trajectory at right. that point you know what right. I mean it was, it was going someplace else um, yeah. but when, when we heard that it was like on and cracking. Now, mind you, her record was done already. That Brandy album was done. Damon Thomas and Harvey Mason Jr., the underdogs at that time, had cut a bunch of stuff. Robin Thicke and John John Robinson had cut a bunch of stuff. Something for the People. Uh, yes. I don't know if you remember them, but Sauce and Jeff yeah. and Rashad. Um, shout out to Trina and Tam. Uh, rest hey. in peace, Fuzzy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, rest in peace, Fuzzy. That was my dude. Um, and um, they had cut a bunch of stuff. So, I mean, that album was really kind of done. So they took I Want to Be Down. They took somebody's song off the record, from what I understand. I was like, oh, God, that's not good. <laughs> but then she, uh, Sylvia Nobody Ryan. Nobody mad at you right now. <laughs> oh, no, no, you have no idea. No, it was really a thing. It was really a thing. Um, uh, uh, Sylvia Ryan, who was president at the label at the time, uh, mm -hmm. said, hey, I like that. You have another one. And Keith came up with the track to Baby. And we, again, went in that same room and me, him, and Rasan, and we bowed. We had it. We did baby. And then, uh, like I said, then there was a story of Broken Hearted where, you know, we had the ballad and Keith and I came up with Broken Hearted. Um, and um, Keith and Glenn McKinney, my other brother, shout out to the McKinney's in San Diego, 619 in the building. Um, they did um, uh, Best Friend. And... Uh, and then she said, okay, we need one more song to open the album. And Keith and I came up with, uh, so if the role don't fit me, got to be moving on. Yeah, so, um, and that was the opener. 
Um, so we ended up with like five songs on the album, and that's only four million right there. But um, nearly five million albums later, yeah, yeah, it was it was quite quite awesome. <clears throat> and while we're on that note, though, Jason, I want to say mm -hmm. this. I, I mean, we got a whole another hour, but <laughs> um, you're fine. We were talking about merchandising. Um, and I want to talk about the power of a great song. So I want to be down turned 25 years old this past September. Man. Um, and Man. so one of the things I wanted to do was some sort of artwork or something to commemorate the 25th anniversary of I want to be down. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought about uh, lyrics on a t-shirt. Uh, everybody does that, you know. Um, but that's just some kind of artwork with the lyrics on a t-shirt maybe kind of or something well i do graphics and you know that i do all my own graphic stuff for my band and that kind of mm -hmm. thing um but i'm not a freehand artist like that and so um my cousin teresa said you know i told her about the concept and she says oh you need to meet me you know denise my friend denise i was like yeah i know denise she's like well, you should see her work. I'm like, I didn't even know Denise was an artist. I just thought she was your friend. She's like, uh, you need to see her work. Go to her Instagram. And I went to her IG and I was like, well, she's got exactly what I'm looking for. I wanted to do um, like a girl with like the lyrics in, in her hair. That oh, kind wow. of thing, right? Wow. Yeah, yeah. And, and so Denise, Michelle, um, Art by Denise Michelle at IG um, had uh, has a line called "Fro Chicks," and it's exactly what I was looking for. Um, so we partnered on a design. She did the artwork. I did the graphics, and I don't know if you can see this, but I'm gonna stand up so you can see it. Oh man! Um, yeah, this is this. Um, you could probably even see it a little better on the mug. Hello. <laughs> Merch. Hello, Merch. Hello, Merch. But it's, uh, I would like to get to know if I could be the kind of girl that you could be down for. Because when I look at you, I feel something tell me that you're the kind of guy that I could make a move on. on, on. Right? Uh, so cool. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, no, this is the chorus, actually. Uh, I want to be down with what you're going through. I want to be down. I want to be down with you. No matter the time of day or night is true. I want to be down. That is so cool. So, ladies and gentlemen, you are the first to see the, what we call the Atlantic line. And it, this is the I want to be down t-shirt and the I want to be down mug. And where is, hold on one second. But wait, the there's girls no are gonna love this. It's a journal. And how perfect. How perfect yeah. is that? Yeah. So and, and the journal has the same, the chorus, and then on the back it has the verse. I would like to get to know if I could be all right, all the way down. So you're the it. first to you're the first to see this. And so you'll see the website pinned at the bottom of your uh, page there, kipperjones.com. There and it is. Go there and sign up for the mailing list. Uh, I think everything goes online tomorrow. Uh, and there you have it. Yeah. How perfect is it? You so get an exclusive, Jason. That's right. It's exclusive, yeah. exclusive stuff. You get an, ex you get an exclusive. Yes. It yes. Is. Just in time for Juneteenth, y'all. Y'all log on to kipperjones.com, sign up for his mailing list. And you will be the first to be notified when that I Want to Be Down merch is available. Incredible, incredible. What's the artist's name again you mentioned? Her name is Denise Michelle, and that is M-E-S-C-H-A-L-E. -E. Um, art by Denise Michelle. I'll, I'll put it, uh, I'll, I'll make sure everybody gets it. If you sign up for the mailing list, of course, you'll get all that information. But um, art, art by Denise Michelle, yes. That is incredible. So when, when you got the song back and you heard Brandy's incredible voice. Did you imagine that she would become this game changer of a vocalist that she has become? Um, I, 
I don't know. Um, you, you know, that record was so groundbreaking in itself. Uh, we were in the midst of the New Jack Swing, like a big time mm -hmm. in 1990. Mm -hmm. and, and that record came with that slow tempo, that mad saturated bass. Uh, rest in peace, Booker T. Jones III, uh, who was our engineer, and um, who Keith and, and Booker um, crafted that, that sound design. Um, with her, her vocal was just, it was so different. Um, you know, uh, I Wanna Be Down was pretty regular, but like when she got the best friend with all that low stuff, um, I mean, girls were like, oh, she sound like a boy. Da, 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 da. I'm like, yeah, say what you want to say. What you want to say is I can't do that. That's what you want to say. Um, but um, I just, I, I don't know if I knew that she would be such a game changer. And I will tell you this. She started changing the game for me at the Full Moon album. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Oh, That's yeah. when, that for me is when I knew that she was just quite special. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I knew, for, for me personally, I knew she was special. When I wrote Broken Hearted, she heard it and went, ooh, 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 I can't wait to do this. I can't wait to do it. Um, <laughs> and she was, supposed to be going to Ma she was supposed to be going to Magic Mountain, uh, I think, that day that we were going to cut the vocals. She, she was just like, oh, I'm not trying to be in the studio right now. Um, but she came in and it was just me, her, and the engineer and her dad. And me and her dad sat there and she goes in there. And when I tell you, Jason, that that little girl, that's basically a one take vocal. Man. I mean, she did some little fixes, but by and large, that's a one take vocal. And I, she, after the first line, when she says, I'm young, but I'm wise enough to know, with this drama in her voice, mm -hmm. I just broke down. I'm really emotional, but I just broke down crying. And her dad just started laughing at me. He said, I know. <laughs> I was like, oh, my God. You know, and I mean, I knew then how, how special she was, but. But that Full Moon album solidified it, put it in a lead case for me, baby, because she killed right. every performance in that. And, and again, rest in peace, LaShawn Daniels. Yes. Um, yes. yes. That in, incredible piece of work. That was just, that body of work was just, uh, you know. Yeah. I mean, the work that Warren Campbell did, and of course, Rodney and, and, and Shiz. Um, mm -hmm. Just, uh, I can't say enough about that record. Uh, Mike City, I'm so sorry. Can't leave out my boy. There you go. There you go. And Fred Jerkins as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Oh, my good. Fred, I'm so sorry, Freddie. Yeah, can't believe I'm Fred. Yeah. Like, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's there right. we go. Should. But yeah, so um, there, we, there you have it. So I know, you know, we're not, we're supposed to be doing songs that change your life. Well, that song certainly changed my life um, in, Absolutely. in great ways. So, yeah. Yeah, and I'm, I'm still going to figure out the, the hands. Y'all y'all teach me how to do that. I don't know. See, he got most of it. I don't know. I got I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. It just look right. You're right. And he, he just wrote the song. He don't need to do the dance. Yeah, I don't know. I, you know they, they asked me about the video. So, yeah. How did they leave you out the video? We'll, we'll rectify that. But anyway. <laughs> The last song on your list is When Your Life Was Low by Joe Sample and Layla Hathaway. The, oh my God, that voice. Man. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so we'll listen to just a little bit and then we'll talk about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Always remember, my friend, the world will change again. Mm. And you may have to come back to everywhere you've been. Oh, Jesus. Mm. Mm. Um, continue. continue. You, uh, are you are ministering. No, it's all <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Will Jennings. Will Jennings. The great yeah. Will Jennings. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. Yeah. It's enough to make you go. Hey. Hey. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Quick one. Um, 
one of the greatest lyricists ever. Um, oh, yeah. Of course, he wrote, you know, I play the street of life. Mm-hmm. There's no place I can go. Great Randy Crawford, yes. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I think Randy Crawford does a version of When Your Life Was Low as well. Yes. Um, yes, she does. But, you know, Layla. <laughs> but Layla at the period dot exclamation point. Yeah. Yeah. Close the book and go to sleep. So, <laughs> but, and win a Grammy. Hmm. Yeah, well, you know, hey, <laughs> that's what happens when you have that kind of, um, I don't know, Will Jennings is just, just one of those guys, man. He has this sensibility. That song took me to, um, I don't know, it just it gives you an out of body experience. It's just such a real, authentic lyric. Um, when your life was low, you had nowhere to go. People turn their backs on you, and everybody said that you were through. I took you in, made you strong again, put you back together out of all the empty pieces uh, that were left behind. You left, I left you shining. Now you're doing well. Some stories I hear tell. Uh, oh, come on, man. So I have a song called Sit Down um, that is so, and I think that's why I love this song so much. Um, I don't think I had ever heard um, Randy Crawford's version of When Your Life Was Low when I wrote Sit Down. But when I heard Layla's version, I'm going, wait a minute. That's almost the same song. Um, it's, it's, it's a song about, and again, this is that artist responsibility piece. You don't have to, every song doesn't have to be about uh, relationship love and dancing or parties or whatever. Sometimes yeah. you can write a song about brother and kids a relationship between friends or whatever. But I had a cousin who was a phenomenal high school basketball player, went through two years at UNLV, was destined for greatness, and blew out his knee, um, and never got drafted into the NBA, um, ended up playing overseas, and that kind of thing, and um, was sending his, uh, well, anyway, something happened, I don't know money and that kind of thing or whatever and when he came back from overseas he showed up at my house mm-hmm. and he was like help and I'm like wow. no 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 there's no help listen if I got a house you got a room you go over there and take that room that's you know and we he lived with me probably for the next couple of years um but there is a uh, there's a lyric in that song that says that if, if I got a house, you got a room, just like in the day when it was just me and you, because you're still my friend, and no matter what, you're welcome here. So take off your coat and sit down. Um, and so those lyrics of sensitivity, man, you have to. When I said be open, be honest, and be humble, that open part is that vulnerability that allows you to just feel. Um, and that when your life was low, it's just, it's, you just feel that way. There's, yeah. there's, it's, it's just this awesome, if you just allow yourself to listen, you can help but feel that. Um, because that's something that everybody is going to associate with. Oh, yeah. Any human being is going to feel that and associate with that. You, know, mm-hmm. you don't have to be black or white or male or female or straight or gay or anything like that. You just have to be human and you're going to feel that. You know? And so that's why that song just means so much to me. Um, yeah. And the fact that, you know, Layla, who is the queen of the planet, is... Uh, <laughs> of the entire planet. Of the entire planet. There is none yeah. of us. Um, I'm still trying to... Still trying to do that thing. Don't, <laughs> don't blame me. Like, I'm trying to sing chords and overtones and Oh, oh Jesus, I'm still trying to do oh, it. Like, uh, so you right. mentioned Will Jennings uh, earlier, who was the lyricist on that song. I just want to let y'all know a few, a few songs of his massive catalog of songs that he wrote. Um, 
didn't we almost have it all from the Houston? Yeah. My heart will go on. Like oh, yeah, the biggest song that. ever. Yeah. Or oh, it feels like the biggest song ever. Um, and Tears in Heaven, Eric Clapton, among so yeah, many. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so many more people. And, and again, and you can listen to every one of those songs, especially Tears in Heaven, my God in heaven. That's, uh, right. It tears you apart, right? <laughs> yeah, it tears you apart. Um, Jeez. Because, because, again, he has this tremendous gift of being absolutely vulnerable and absolutely open to allow that to manifest into words. And it's not some Chinese arithmetic problem. It's always very simple. Always very simple. You know, uh, yeah, it's just an incredible, incredible gift to the songwriting community. Um, my hat's off to Wood Jones. It's just incredible. Like, I'm not gonna take my hat off right now, but yeah. <laughs> Literally, I probably uh, figuratively, hats off to Will Jennings. So yeah. open, honest, and humble. You've mentioned that a few times, but um, those are absolutely keys to to the songwriting gift and allowing um, the message to be channeled through you, as you mentioned. Yes, um, I I've been very blessed in my life to be around some of the uh, greats, as it were, in this business who. Who have I've, I've had the chance to uh, kind of receive jewels from them uh, that they pour into me, and one of those people is uh, Quincy Jones. Um, and wait, who? who? Yeah, who guy just he's 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 this old guy. He lives in L.A. Oh, Quincy okay, okay, gotcha. Quincy D. Light. I don't think yeah. I've heard of him. Yeah, Quincy D. Light Jr. <laughs> <laughs> but, but he is an incredible being. One of the things he said uh, that has always stuck with me is that when you're engaged in the creative process, uh, to pull up an empty chair. Mm. So that when the muse, so he says the muse, and I say God. So I say, so when God comes to visit, he has a place to sit. Wow. Wow. And uh, that has always stuck with me. Especially when I'm stuck. Um, mm. Yeah. And so, um, you know, some people have said open a window, you know, things like that. But that really stuck with me. Yeah, pull up an empty chair. Allow space for, for God or the muse to come on in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Man, yeah. that is incredible. I mean, you know, I've, I've, it's crazy, man. I'm just this kid from South Central LA and I, I you know, Quincy Jones introduced me to Michael Jackson. Uh, um, uh, Luther I Vandross. I'm throw something at this phone right now. You're dropping these names like they just break it. No, because I'm saying it's, <laughs> it's, it's, this, it's, it's serendipitous, but it's at the same time, it's very ordained. Uh, I think that when you are operating in your gift that God aligns you to where you're supposed to be and with who you're supposed to be with and all of that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I used to, uh, uh, Vanessa's first husband, Ramon, uh, had he and another dear friend of mine, Bill Hammond, uh, Ramon and Bill, R&B Live. They had a thing in L.A. called R&B Live back in the early 90s. And um, it was a, a space on Wednesday nights that um, all the entertainers and athletes and hoity-toities would come. Um, and gather, and whoever was in town, whether it was Chaco or Prince or BB and CC Winans or whatever musical artist George Benson would come and perform. And I was like the mascot. I was the opening guy. He come, I come, sing some songs. And so Wesley Snipes ends up being a big fan, and we've been friends forever. Uh, Mike Tyson <laughs> ends up being a big fan, and we've been friends forever. Um, Martin Lawrence and you know, just because everybody would come and just hang out and chill, and that's where you went, right, to R&B Live. Um, and so there was one lady who used to come. Her name was Paulette McWilliams. Um, and she, you may know her name if you've ever read Liner Notes from a Luther Vandross record. Um, and she, because uh, she was one of Luther's background singers, 
If you've ever been to a Luther Vandross concert, there's Ava Cherry and Lisa Fisher on stage with Kevin um, as background singers. But in the pit, there's, uh, let's see, Pat and Paulette and uh, Valerie Kingston, I think. There's, there's like four or five singers in the pit uh, mm -hmm. that you don't see. Um, okay. You know, so, but that's why you get this huge vocal sound. Um, right. And but Paulette um, and I have a time, you know, have a bit of a history, and so she kept telling Luther, she's like, "You need to call Kevin, and you need to use him on something." And you know, again, he's like, "Oh, whatever." So, <laughs> so one day, and this is '93, I guess, or so, um, I'm at home and I get this call. And it's, Hello, my sister Skipper Jones. And says, uh, sure, Master's calling. Like, uh, yes, this is Luther Vandross. I'm like. Just it's just Luther, just on the so phone. I, yeah. So then I thought about it and I said, okay, yeah, right. So who is this? I kept playing on my phone. And so he goes, oh, oh, okay. Well, I tell you what. Um, if you're available tomorrow night, seven thirty, and I'm doing a session at Record Plant, the soundtrack project I'm doing, I need you and I need another tenor guy. So if you can bring a guy with you, if there's somebody that you sing with or whatever, and be there at seven thirty. That's it. So, and it's just dead silence. And so he goes, "Hello." <laughs> I'm like, "Oh yeah, 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 yeah." No, no, no. I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm here. He's like, "Well, are you coming?" And I'm like, "Oh no, no. Yes, yes. I'm there." Um, I said, "But can I ask you something?" And he goes, "Sure." I said, um, "Yeah. Do you um, usually have a problem when you just calling people out the blue talking about this Luther Vandross?" <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, shut up, boy. I'll see you tomorrow. So, <laughs> and I went the next day, and he was amazing and wonderful, and shall not cry. But he was everything I thought he would be, and then some. Oh, and man. So we were able to, you know, maintain our friendship. But I kept telling him, I was like, you know, his kids call him Uncle Ronnie. I'm like, Uncle Ronnie. I want to go on the road with you, though, because I want to wear the suit and, you know, I want to do the whole thing. You know, he, was, he was like, uh-uh, no. I'm like, why? You said you like me, though. He's like, yeah, I do. And that's why I'm not taking you on the road, because you, you would hate me, because I'm going to have you singing too high, and you're not going to like it. And it's just like, oh, my God. I'm willing to find that out. Please, just, you know. He was like, uh-uh, no. But it was, it was great. He was wonderful and and the song that we did was called hero and it's on the uh, it's the it's called the heart of a hero i'm sorry the, the movie was called hero with gina davis andy garcia and dustin hoffman um, okay. and you can find that at youtube or anything but the song is called heart of a hero and i'm singing on that with my number one singing idol ever mr luther vandross so, awesome you know. see i'll so take that out part of a hero luther vandross so yes. my, my my life, man, has just, you know, I, I haven't even talked about, like, about the relationship I have with Bobby the Bars and, you know, that whole family and, mm -hmm. and you know, and that kind of thing and, and, and watching Leon Silver's work and stuff and then talking to him a few years ago and having him say, oh, no, but I watched you all the time. You never knew I was watching you. And I was like, what are you saying? Right. You know, yeah. I mean, to have the day that Prince passed away, um, I had a friend, uh, her name is April, April Hartfield. She sent me a message. She said, Skipper, um, I remember when Prince, Prince called my sister and I and said to meet him at his club. He wanted us to see this singer um, that he was gigging. And she said, and that was the very first time that I ever saw you in a band playing at the city. So, wow. And I'm like, I was like, what are you saying out of your mouth right now? Wow. <laughs> you know, and oh, dear Lord in heaven. I wow. Said, Why would you wait till the day he left <laughs> to tell me this? Wow. But, you know, just, just serendipitous and, and blessed. And I'm just, I'm just, I'm grateful, JJ. I'm just a grateful guy. Man, well, I am grateful that you took the time out of your schedule to do 
my little Instagram show, Five Songs That Changed My Life. Thank you for, for blessing the audience with so many gems tonight. This has been absolutely incredible, as I knew it would be. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you for having me. And, um, and to everyone, um, this, is, this is an interesting time that we're living in right now. Mm -hmm. um, just know that we're going to be all right. Um, take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. God bless you and God keep you is my prayer. Yes, beautiful, beautiful. So real quick before we go, the website is pinned at the bottom. T tell people what they can expect from you going forward. What, what do we have coming up? Oh, funny you should ask. <laughs> <laughs> Commercial time. Commercial time. Ding, 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 ding. Okay, so I have a new single. Um, I have a dance music EP that will be coming out this summer called Trip the Soul Fantastic. Anybody mm -hmm. that knows me here in Atlanta, knows that I have a band called Kipper Jones R&B Circus. We are, not a trip, we are not a tribute band. We're an R&B homage band. We hold up the banner of black music, R&B and soul music. And um, so what I've decided to do is take some of my favorite soul music classics and flip them as dance records. I think we need to dance right now. Yeah. We yeah. just need to dance right now. We, we, it's, it's a heavy atmosphere. Um, and so I, I'm, I, um, the new single, which is a cover of the Rolls Royce classic, Wishing on a Star, okay. done, done as a, an EDM slash house record. And I think y'all going to like it. No, you're going to There was it, a little actually. piece in the flyer, y'all. If y'all saw the video flyer, there was a little snippet of it in there. There's a little snippet. You were probably like, what is that? That's what it was. And it will be out on July 3rd. So if you go to the website, there's more information about that. Um, then there's also, again, the Black Bettys, who are Cherie and Sharita Murphy, who are my background singers, singers the background of me with the R&B Circus. And they also sing with Keith Sweat and every freaking body else. They're just amazing, and they're twins, and they're dope as crap. Um, but anyway, I've written a new song for them, and it's called You Belong to Me. And I believe that this is going to be the beginning of a, uh, an EP that we're going to do together as well. But this okay. people on the me song, Jason. Yeah. Is yeah. Nasty, bro. Oh, and as a matter of fact, I just got the mix, uh, the first draft of the mix back today from a young lady. And a shout out to Octavia Landick, who has been uh, just an amazing addition to uh, my cipher right now. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, uh, my, my dear friend Cornelius Mims and I, who have maintained a relationship for almost 45 years, um, we uh, are. He turned me on to Octavia, who's an incredible engineer, recording engineer, and she's doing the mixes uh, for me, for uh, for my stuff and for the girls' record. So those two things are coming up. Um, of course, there's the merch line, so please be on the lookout. Um, mm -hmm. There's also No Better with Kipper Jones, which is every first and third Tuesday night on the Status Network. You can reach that at statusnetwork.net. Um, and that is my talk show where we talk mostly social issues and politics um, and, and that sort of thing. But we've had some really cool um, guests outside of that. Uh, Vanessa came on one night and we, we chopped it up for an hour or so. And Sid Bad, yeah, Sid Bad came on and that was bananas because that's my boy from way back. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's every first and third. Uh, this is No Better with Kipper Jones. And there's. Uh, also, more information on that at the website as well. Um, I'm finishing up this Berkeley degree, man, so I can get in the classroom <laughs> and be and give back all of this stuff that I've spent this time putting together and uh, li or living living it out. And that's uh, that's kind of you know that's that's what Kipper Jones is doing. I love it. I love. It. Well, thank you so much for giving back to to myself and to the audience here tonight. Um, yeah, just, just, I'm immensely grateful. Thank you so much, Kipper. Jason, thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. God bless you in your career. Um, you know, I don't know if y'all know, you know, Jason is one old little singer songwriter too now. Uh, I do, I he, do a thing. He, he, do a he'll thing. give you a show now. So he will give oh, you a man. show. So, you know. Oh man, good play. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Everybody, thank you for tuning in. This has been Five Songs That Changed My Life with Mr. Kipper Jones. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you all.